So good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Benoit Curé, and I'm the head of the uh, Bank for International Settlements uh, Innovation Hub in Basel. Um, today is the third day of the Green Swan Conference, uh, and I'm very happy that we can uh, take a step uh, away from capital markets uh, and the world of finance to uh, discuss um, consumer lifestyle choices. Uh, that is um, what you can do, what we can do as individuals to uh, to make the planet greener. Uh, and um, when you ask uh, when you ask consumers about uh, what they can do uh, to help uh, and to contribute to the uh, to the broader objectives of uh, mitigating climate change and uh, reducing the carbon footprint of uh, of our economy, um, you have different answers. That is. People are aware that they have to do it. Uh, they uh, they see the value uh, for themselves and for the uh, and for society. Um, but uh, depending on social groups, depending on countries, they have different answers to the question of you know what can you practically do to uh, to support the broader uh, effort. Um, so younger people uh, are more aware of the benefits of uh, of uh, getting uh, vegetarian or vegan. Uh, older people uh, place more value in uh, recycling, and you also have different answers in different places. So there are lots of behavioral biases, which, uh, as we know, have been studied at length by uh, uh, behavioral uh, economists and psychologists. Um, and there is a lot we can do to, to help people navigate uh, through these uh, constraints and initiatives uh, to uh, increase their awareness and also to create the right incentives, that is, to nudge them towards uh, taking the right decisions uh, for the uh, for climate and for the planet. Um, and since uh, climate change is a public good, uh, we need a lot of international uh, discussion and a lot of international collaboration around these efforts. So that's the motto for uh, our discussion today. Um, I am uh, very pleased that we are joined uh, this morning uh, by uh, Brune Poisson, who is the um, former Secretary of State for uh, ecological transition uh, in France uh, and uh, uh, currently Chief Sustainability Officer with ACCOR. Uh, we're also uh, joined by um, Dr. Long Chen, who's the director of the Luohan Academy, and uh, Dr. Masamba Thioi, who's the um, um, manager for uh, regulatory frameworks implementation at the uh, UNFCCC in, uh, in Bonn. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us this morning. Um, our panel will seek to answer the question, can innovations in market-based um, approaches using consumer carbon tracing influence our consumer lifestyle choices? And uh, as a conclusion, uh, let me mention that the BIS Innovation Hub is contributing to the debate. Um, one of our projects uh, based in Hong Kong uh, is Project Genesis. Um, which uh, aims to develop a prototype to uh, introduce uh, tokenized green bonds uh, in small denominations, uh, giving retail investors access to, uh, to these uh, green products. And that project will integrate real-time tracking uh, and disclosure of the green output uh, for investors. That is, uh, you will have an app on your mobile phone and you can see how much uh, uh, solar energy has been produced uh, thanks to the green bond that you've purchased as a, as a retail investor. So that's an example of how you can bring the right information to the uh, to the uh, to the retail investor who's also a, uh, a consumer and we've also launched together with the uh, Banca d'Italia the um, G20, G20 tech sprint uh, to address issues in green and sustainable finance and the 2021 initiative uh, focuses on uh, how technological innovation can uh, help financial institutions and investors to uh, collect to verify and to and to process uh, and analyze data uh, to support uh, to support green frameworks, so um, we're all um, in the same boat, uh, and uh, we're going to discuss how to uh, how to um, uh, which initiatives work. Uh, we want that discussion to be practical, very much uh, close to the ground, and how we can uh, we can uh, we can help consumer uh, uh, formulate uh, choices uh, and uh, and have a better life. So um, let me start with a uh, with a round of initial questions to our panelists, and thank you again for being with us this morning. And I would like to uh, to start uh, by um, asking uh, Masamba Thioi a broad question from the United Nations perspective, which is the 
the most global perspective anyone can have. Um, in your opinion, um, what can be the benefits and, and challenges of carbon tracing and la labeling for consumers? Uh, and, and how does uh, the, uh, the United Nations, namely the UNFCCC, see uh, international coordination on, on these issues? Masamba, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Benoit. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, and good evening um, to all participants. Um, the, I would say that one of the most important benefits related to uh, carbon footprinting is that it enables to complement the current um, production base and problem oriented approach of climate action with a consumption base and a more solution oriented approach to climate action. So actually it enables the recognition and the incentive, incentive um, of climate actions that otherwise wouldn't be recognized or incentivized. So the interest of the consumption-based approach is that it does not focus on decarbonizing sectors through a decrease of the carbon footprint of their product. It rather explore options for uh, disrupting carbon incentive market and value chain to satisfy the citizens' need with alternative value chain that are more aligned with the climate goal. So um, therefore, the carbon footprinting of product and services will expand the space of climate action to unusual climate actor and new and more transformative type of climate action. So as its primary objective is to satisfy needs, but to do it in a sustainable way, it also encourages the mainstreaming of climate action into SDG action. So carbon footprinting will enable uh, climate action framework, which is human-centered, a climate action framework for and by individual citizens. So indeed, it will enhance their awareness about the carbon footprint of products and services, as well as the impact of change in their consumption behavior. It will also empower these individual citizens to become more um, to become climate actor and able to undertake transformative climate action. It will give them also access to incentive instrument. So at the city level, uh, it will um, facilitate the development of a consumption-based approach for cities GSG accounting, which is the most um, appropriate approach uh, to recognize and incentivize climate action in cities. So indeed, it will put accountability for GSG emission and give credit for GSG emission avoidance, where the most impactful type of climate action can be undertaken. So while a production-based type of climate action will mainly lead to incremental into improvement because its aim is mainly to reduce the carbon footprint of product and services without changing this product, a consumption-based climate action can entirely uh, disrupt carbon intensive market and enhance consumption efficiency. So to be practical, I would like just to give some example. Um, GSG mitigation action in the seven sector will try to improve the carbon footprint of the cement but it will not change the product, it will not disrupt the product. So cost, construction company, uh, at the difference of this sectoral approach, can decide to replace cement with, for example, renewable wood for construction, and by doing so, contribute in uh, disrupting the cement supply chain. Um, the same replacing combustion car with EV car 
is a great type of climate action. However, it is still production-based and less impactful than not having a car at all. So indeed, reducing the need of mobility to address access by building more compact, complete, and connected cities is much more transformative than moving from combustion car to EV car. In addition to disrupting carbon intensive market and supply chain, carbon footprinting of product and services promote also enhanced circular economy as well as a sharing economy by enabling the measurement of the impact of more efficient consumption and its recognition with a granularity down to the level of individual citizen. It enables to recognize the impact and incentivize enhanced circularity of the value chain, satisfying the citizen's core need through value-added usage of products. So when citizens, for example, recover or uh, recycle, um, through extended lifetime of product or their part, through repurposing, remanufacturing, refurbishing, repairing, or reusing, and also through smart purchase and, and use. Now, what are the challenges of carbon tracing for, for consumers? They are fourfold. The first challenge is the complexity related to the measurement of the carbon footprint of products and services. So currently, the UNFCCC Secretariat and my team, we are mainly my team, we are reflecting on the development of a new consumption-based approach to GSG accounting that will be more relevant to cities and individual citizens. So we have planned to develop the framework and to apply it to the determination of the carbon footprint of key product. The second challenge is harmonization of the method for determining the carbon footprint of product. So the growing interest in consumption-based approach to climate action and the need for enhanced transparency about carbon footprint of product has led to the creation of numerous standards for the determination of product carbon footprint. We can provide as example ISO standard, CDP, GRI, and uh, SBTI. So, however, with the prolifer proliferation of these standards come, comes misalignment on approach for carbon footprinting. There is currently no harmonized method for carbon footprinting uh, recognized by everybody. So the variation covers both calculation method and emission factor, as well as data source and what is considered um, relevant inclusion. So the third challenge is the fact that awareness of product carbon, carbon footprint is not always sufficient to trigger a change of behavior. Consumer need to be empowered and incentivized to change their behavior. So this can be done through the development of a recognition and incentive scheme, including in the form of a market mechanism, allowing participation of individual citizens. Now, re regulation uh, may be required where decision of individual citizen cannot necessarily be based on rational choice. However, both market mechanism and regulation to foster climate action by individual citizens require carbon footprinting. The fourth challenge is the coordination across value chain. The type of transformative climate action we expect require cluster involving policymakers, financial, corporate, technology provider, consumer, and it has to be done across cities, regions, and countries, collaborating on the development of climate solution. To address that challenge, the UFCCC has planned to launch at COP26 a global uh, hub for innovative climate action that will be a platform 
which will have access to both database of demand and supply of climate solution on policy, finance, technology, business model, and uh, which will promote co-innovation by the entities of the cluster to develop transformative need-based and solution-oriented type of climate action that can change the entire supply chain currently used to satisfy our core need and to promote moonshot uh, thinking and to bridge between demand and supply of climate solution and to measure the impact of consumption-based climate solution and attribute the credit to the different part of the new climate aligned value chain and for each part of the value chain to the relevant stakeholders the financial technology provider utilities policy maker and so and so so addressing all these issues require to leverage the new digital technology such as iot dlt and uh, artificial intelligence just to conclude i will i will say that the the innovation hub that we plan to launch at uh, cop26 will um, look for will seek collaboration with other innovation hub as i mentioned to be able to connect and get um, uh, data on solution climate solution both on technology but also policy as well as financial and probably will be very much interested to engage with with peace and find way to collaborate on this specific issue back to you benoit thank you uh, thank you very much masamba and uh, let me uh, let me jump on the on the offer and uh, and yes there is a lot we can do together uh, in terms of innovation um, and I, I hope that later in the session we'll have an opportunity to uh, to get uh, to get deeper into some of these technological solutions that you've been uh, that you've been mentioning, uh, but uh, let me uh, let me highlight one one sentence you said, Masamba, which is that uh, consumer awareness is uh, is not sufficient. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient, uh, and uh, consumers need to be uh, empowered uh, and uh, incentivized, and that's really the essence of what we're discussing today. So so let let me turn to uh, let me turn to uh, to Dr. Chen. Um, the um, the green uh, the green fintech ecosystem uh, is rapidly growing uh, with uh, with many companies exploring uh, the use of technological innovation to uh, to support uh, sustainability goals and the um, the Ant uh, Financial Services Group had been at the center of this uh, innovative uh, effort uh, in association with the United Nations. Uh, and uh, and has initiated the world's first large-scale pilot in uh, ingraining uh, consumption behavior uh, to encourage uh, ONS users to uh, to reduce the carbon footprint. So so that's on forest. Can you can you tell us more about the initiative and more generally on what uh, uh, what uh, what you've been up to in terms of uh, uh, novel solutions to uh, to change consumer habits? Yes, uh, thank you, Bonard, for giving me this opportunity to share the experience of the Ant Forest. So starting from payment, uh, the Ant Group was one of the pioneers in China that used digital technology to promote uh, uh, financial inclusion. So back in 2016, uh, so I was the chief strategy officer of the group. And so I was personally involved uh, in designing this interesting product called the uh, Ant Forest. So back then, so China's environmental issue was really severe and clear to most of the citizens, the consumers in China. We kind of can, we can see it, we can taste it, and uh, we can smell it. But uh, most consumers uh, couldn't do anything about it. And uh, related, we also found that uh, green finance is the least inclusive part of finance. So normally we see the government, government officers and the big companies commit to do things, but the majority of the consumers, the citizens and companies can, couldn't get involved. So with that background, we decided to design this app application called uh, On Forest. So the logic then is to use the digital technology to track upon the uh, user's approval their uh, carbon footage. Uh, carbon reduction footage uh, and then we can turn that 
uh, uh, that record into something that can be circulable to, into the some certain values. So, for example, let's say Benoit, you decide you want to become a, a better citizen tomorrow. You decide that you would like to take subway to work rather than driving to work. So that will lead to a carbon reduction. So then what I'm showing here, as you, I hope you can see this, it is actually a shot, it's a live shot of, the, of my Alipay's uh, 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 app. So here you can see, let's say, Bernard dis, they have generated some carbon reduction activity. It will become this little green ball here. So then for everybody, you can actually collect these little green balls, this energy. So then it, if you collect this little green ball, the, the virtual tree will grow. And um, if this virtual tree grow into a mature tree, then a real tree will be planted in designated areas. Now, you can choose which type of tree you want to grow and where you want to devote this to. And for example, for me, I'm here to, uh, to see there's all kinds of trees. I'm going to just see, show you some of, and this is the regime I'm going to devote it to in some of the uh, northern areas in China. And if you, uh, if I, this is the desert area, you can see that, and this is my tree in there. I have planted plant multiple trees there. And if I keep, if I go further, you can see exactly the China, through the Chinese Google map version. So every user know precisely where his tree is planted. If he's interested, he can even drive there to see his tree, how, or her tree, how it grows. Of course, they won't do it because, but actually later people's, the, the fans, they form the traveling groups to see where are the trees and that combines the, the traveling uh, uh, interests. Now, so that's part of this design. Now, another part of the important design is that we make this, we try to make this uh, to, be, uh, to be a part of the game. Uh, because people, as just uh, 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 Masamba mentioned, people need to be incentivized and they need to fund is fun. So what we, another thing we do then here is that it's part of the game. So in addition to the user can collect his or her own energy, a green energy have produced, they can actually collect their friends. You can see below there, there's a bunch of friends. They can collect from each other. They steal each other's green energy. Of course, in the end, they all come into the, produce into the trees. Now, so that really adds a lot of fun. So they feel it's like they're playing a game. Now, the reason why we, we decided to plant trees, because in the beginning, we actually, would like to turn those green energies into some value. Maybe they can go to some carbon exchange to be exchanged into value, but then we find that there's no exchange to accept the, 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 the consumers, the little green uh, balls. And on top of that, the, the carbon price was too low. It's, it's, it's very little at that time. So to motivate the, the consumers to do that. So we decided to, to turn into growing trees and they, they do it in a in a group a game game like fashion. So that's the, the the basic idea. And after it was launched back in August of 2016, then it quickly uh, without any advertisement, it quickly becomes the largest. Uh, I would think a group a consumer side of the of the personal uh, account accounting of their uh, uh, green behavior in in the world. Because in the past several years, now we have more than 550 million users who have agreed to adopt the program. What this really means is that more than 7% of the global population, they are watching their green behavior every day. They are, and they are growing trees every day. They have planted more than 230 million trees. They have, in many areas, they are big enough that and can easily see them uh, through the satellite. Um, so that's one interesting experiment. It's, it's pretty uh, cool. And on top of that, it also prepared a whole wave of those digital uh, uh, environmental program using uh, gamification in China. So that can stimulate a lot of people using it. So looking back, it was successful uh, because we are able to use the digital technology to measure users' green behavior. 
uh, and we can and uh, we incentivize them to make it into a game and also they they kind of the, it's like the fun they, they play with each other and also they understand that it can turn into a tree it's very easy to, for them to understand how it uh, becomes a tree and so with those little uh, things it be, has been uh, seems to be successful and the, the so in this way then we have some successfully build an ecosystem that makes the uh, users hundreds of millions of users and a lot of institutions because they become part of the involvement too we have, we have built an ecosystem everybody becomes a climate a partner a user or it's an ecosystem for esc you, you want to put, put this way so i think that uh, seems to be a good example to show that the um uh to that, we, we understand that digital tools uh, are famous for uh, scalability, but we can you make, take advantage of that of those tools uh, to to serve social purposes. And so, and based on that, we started to work with the UNEP. So, because we want to share this experience to the world, we believe those principles are uh, can be replicated uh, in a lot of countries across the world. So, those, that's the basic idea of the. Of the unforest. Let me stop here for now. Thank you very much, Long. I mean, that's a that's a fascinating experience, and uh, certainly one that can be uh, replicated. I mean, in, in different ways, but in in, uh, in many places. And I, I think it's it speaks to a uh, what's a what's a uh, what's a what's a core uh, le lesson of uh, behavioral economics, which is that people react to positive incentives. Uh, they actually react more to negative incentives, and uh, climate action is full of negative incentives when you think about it, like taxes. Economy, economists love taxes, we love Pigovian taxes, uh, but consumers uh, hate taxes, uh, of course. And so if you want to kind of overcome the, uh, the, uh, the psychological impact of all the negative policies that you will have to take to enforce climate action, you also need uh, a lot of positive thinking, uh, and then what you just described is part of it. And it can be very helpful to uh, to support and complement, which which brings me in a sense to uh, to my to my third question, and that will be directed to uh, to Brun. Um, I mean, we know that individuals don't make decisions based on uh, on perfect information and uh, and uh, and uh, and rational choice. Uh, there are there are lots of biases, and and a lot of lots of these biases are are social biases. They are influenced by cultural uh, aspects and social norms. Uh, the results from uh, routines and habits uh, that uh, that are framed by uh, by uh, by collective choices, and that's where politics comes in. Um, and so you uh, you are uh, uniquely placed to share with us your experience as a uh, as a government minister in France, uh, responsible for the environment uh, and for um, uh, nudging <laughs> uh, nudging habits not only at individual level but also uh, at the at the collective level because that's what ministers do. So, so can you share with us a little bit of your experience and how do you uh, how do you go around it and uh, and which which kind of challenges did you meet when you when you were a minister? Many thanks, Benoit. First of all, allow me to really thank you and to say hi. Great uh, an honor it is really to be on a panel with, with you, Benoit, uh, and and with uh, Masamba and Dr. Long. I, I found uh, the discussion really fascinating so far. One of the to me, one of the main barriers um, to, to actually having um, carbon um, carbon accounting and 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 and, uh, and when we're discussing work is really the issue of trust. And I think it raises three questions that we need as you know policymakers, but even as uh, consumers to answer. The first one is why, then it's how, and then it's who or with whom. So. Um, First, why? I mean, the very idea of having, um, you know, of, of putting a, a carbon uh, footprint on products and on actually uh, uh, providing information on the environment footprint on products uh, is very, very much uh, challenged. At least, let me give you an example that I will actually uh, uh, go through. Uh, in France, one of the things that we've been trying to do for years now is um, to put a, a carbon uh, footprint on food. And 
strictly on meat and on red meat. And the very idea of just doing that has taken almost a decade of conversations, of meetings, of trying to build a consensus, just on uh, agreeing on the idea of doing that. And so slowly, uh, we sort of came to an agreement, and which is sort of what I, what I led when I was uh, uh, in government. It led to an argument, to a, an agreement. But then it raised a second question, uh, which was how? How do we do that? Uh, again, which methodology do you use? Do you go for the life cycle um, analysis methodology, or do you also use other criteria? And this takes another sort of few years of negotiations and, and, and work to actually reach a consensus. And there is still a very heated debate in France. For example, uh, just to, to keep going with the example of red meat, we've had to um, the, the, a lot of farmers in France argued that the life cycle uh, analysis would actually favor uh, farmers coming from Latin America versus the French ones. And they were saying that it was actually that it should be used, the life cycle analysis, more for uh, industrial products rather than uh, red meat. And so we had to work and, and sort of come up with a set of common criteria to analyze and, and to, uh, to, to put really a, a footprint on, on the carbon. Uh, so that again took a few years and, and trust me, the discussions are sort of still uh, ongoing. And then there is another issue again on the keep, keeping on uh, with the with the issue of, uh, of trust is who does it? Um, and it's really this issue of trust who collects the data and then who shares it. And in France, for example, um, and, and perhaps, it, and I suspect it is like that in most parts of, of Europe and, and even in, in other places, consumers might, might not actually really trust the label or the footprint that the government puts in place. And so what we've realized is that in a lot of instances, they would go for private apps. Uh, that are actually developed by by uh, by private companies, and sometimes they're even more biased, uh, and they're, they're sometimes not as scientific uh, and not as strong in terms of um, of you know science and data data as the government ones. But yet, consumers trust them more than they trust the government. Precisely because they know that the government has had to go through a whole set of negotiations and discussions with the farmers uh, to come up with actually uh, the, the label and the footprinting uh, of the carbon emissions. So, so, just, so, so on, on paper, it is a great idea. It works really. It, it, this is the thing to do um, because people, when they understand things, they change their behavior more easily. We know that. Um, but yet, it is such so difficult to do and such actually a very very political process uh, at least in my mind and this is why i found uh, dr dr long's presentation absolutely fascinating uh, a, a lot of uh, i'll go and, and try to log myself on a lot of uh, great inspiration but but i just wanted to share the fact that a great and rational idea, just like Benoit said, is actually might turn out to be very, very uh, difficult to implement. This is this is sort of obvious, but I wanted to share what we've been through, just very concretely. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Brun. Um, we'll um, we'll um, le le let's try to go deeper into the issues and. Uh, I also would like to keep time at the end of this discussion to take questions from the audience because we are. We are. We do have a global audience for this conference, and and uh, uh, um, 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 participants are asking questions on social networks. So I'll uh, try to uh, distill and collect some of these questions and and bring them to the discussion. But um, ju just to try to uh, to go a little bit deeper and uh, and uh, and to um, uh, and to try to um, to. Um, to to gather practical solutions. That's what I'm doing, doing here. I'm fishing for you know really practical ideas that we can we can take forward um and um and uh, i was i was intrigued uh, masamba when you mentioned some of the technological solutions that can be used and we already had one example through uh, through on forest uh, at uh, at uh, uh, at um, 
um, at uh, at um, at, con at consumer level. Uh, but you you mentioned uh, the challenge of uh, coordinating across value chains, that is uh, from the up upstream and downstream to uh, to keep to keep track of the carbon footprint and bring it to uh, to the consumer, which requires coordination with uh, of course with the, the production side uh, the pro production uh, side of uh, of the uh, of the value chain, and you mentioned some of the uh, technological solutions that can be used. You mentioned uh, blockchains uh, as uh, as registers to to keep track. Uh, you mentioned the Internet of Things um, as a way to to connect with uh, with devices uh, such as uh, sensors, smart sensors, uh, maybe uh, GPS data, satellite data. So, can you expand a little bit more on your experience of uh, what helps, what works, what doesn't work uh, in that field? So, thank you, uh, Benoit. Uh, in fact, the four challenge related to carbon footprinting identify uh, during my previous intervention, namely the issue of complexity, the issue of harmonization, coordination, as well as the need of an incentive instrument. This issue can be addressed through leverage of the digital technology, including the one on the data supply chain. As you mentioned, Internet of Things at the production of data, uh, distributed leadership technology for the transfer of data and artificial intelligence for intelligent workflow taking automated decision. And actually the three issue I have mentioned, the three first complexity, harmonizing, harmonization and coordination are to a large extent linked also to the issue of trust that was mentioned by, by Brun, because the more it is complex, the more uh, you people understand and the more it is difficult to, to build the trust. And also, if you do not have an harmonization, if you have proliferation of uh, standards that are contradicting each other, it will confuse people and then they will lose trust. And this is why all these things are need, needed to be, need to be addressed so that uh, trust can be there. Uh, what is really interesting is that the emerging um, digital technology can help address uh, all these issues. So the current consumption-based approach to GSG accounting is too complex. Uh, this is why a production-based approach is generally taken. So we are actually extremely good on measuring um, um, the GSG emission coming from a specific site. We are extremely good on doing um, GSG inventory. But when it comes to doing the carbon footprinting of product, because precisely it includes a life cycle analysis, um, it includes um, understanding the supply chain as well as where GSG are emitted. This is uh, really a challenge. This is really complex. And this complexity is related, the complexity of consumption-based approach is related to the fact that um, we are using what I would call an Eulerian approach to describe the flow of unbudget carbon in product. So it means that the observer um, aiming to account for the GSG emission related to the consumption of a citizen, focus on that citizen, identifying the product it consumes, and trying to figure out their carbon footprint. But rebuilding the history of this product at that stage can be very challenging. And availability of data is the main barrier to this approach. So to address that challenge at the UNFCCC Secretariat, we are exploring the use of what I will call a Lagrangian, Lagrangian approach for the description of the flow of ambojet carbon. So the carbon footprint of product is determined by following the product and their ambojet GHG emissions through time and space along the value chain. It is possible then to keep track of their trajectory and their history. Each ton of ambojet GHG emission will carry its own properties 
and the different product in which it has been ambushed changing with time until its uh, product carrier is consumed by an end consumer. So this tracking is possible if digital technologies such as distributed ledger technology, including blockchain, the internet of things and artificial intelligence, global position sensor, and radio frequency identification are leveraged. So this is about the complexity part. Now for individual citizen and their, uh, we, we, we said that they, they, they need to be incentivized. Individual citizens should be part of the solution for a scale up and accelerated pace of response to the current sustainability crisis. It was mentioned by Dr. Long, that's uh, very important. We cannot uh, win this fight against climate change if you are not able to mobilize individual citizens. But their contribution need to be measured, recognized, and incentivized. Digital technology can facilitate the measurement of climate contribution down to that level of granularity, down to the level of individual citizen. Through um, digital technology, the GSG emission of the different part of the value chain are uh, determined. So, the internet of things, the immutability function of the DLT, its consensus building function, as well as its distributed nature, ensure that the information related to the carbon footprinting of product is produced and transferred without alteration. This is important for the issue of trust. So the GPS provide information related to where the carbon ambojet has been emitted from. And the smart contract facilitates the transfer of responsibility for GHG emission from producer to consumer. In the approach that we are taking, um, measurement is done at the production site, but then during the transaction, just like value, the, the, the transfer of value is uh, tracked by, by, by blockchain, we will track here the transfer of responsibility from the producer with, to which is allocated first the GSG emission uh, to the consumer who will become now the responsible for this um, GSG um, emission. And this can be done through um, a smart contract that will do this transfer automatically including the transfer of responsibility of GSG emission, GSG emission to the end consumer. That will be triggered by digital payment. So currently we have debit and credit card attributing the responsibility of GSG emission related to the carbon ambojet in product to their buyer. This already exists, this is available. However, these are based on average calculation of carbon footprint for the product and and this is not really precise and this is what also bring this issue of of trust because uh, we all know that um, for example steel production depend on uh, the carbon footprint um, and and the carbon intensity of the uh, grid of of the electricity that has been used to produce this steel so you cannot say all still have the same carbon footprint. It depends on where they are produced from. So, and this is this issue of differentiation that um, the approach that is proposed now is, is um, uh, addressing. Um, so this will replace the theoretical average value of carbon footprint with real value taking into account the real GHG emission emitted along the real supply chain and using life cycle analysis. DLT will also facilitate the involvement of individual citizens in the trading of carbon credit. This is also very important for the incentive instrument. They should be able to participate in a um, carbon market and trade among themselves um, carbon credit considered as, as value. 
So the last issue addressed with the use of digital technology is the issue of coordination. The cluster of climate solution from policy making, finance, technology, innovation, innovative business model that are relevant to address a given demand for climate solution on the hub for innovative climate action that we are um, launching at COP will be identified by an artificial intelligence power tool supported by human creation. Here again, the immutability and consensus building function of DLT, uh, distributed leadership technology, are used to attribute to climate contribution, uh, to attribute the climate contribution to the climate actor along the supply chain without double counting. So if you have um, along the supply chain, let's say from, um, if, if you take geothermal uh, electricity, for example, and then you have actor at the exploration phase, and then you have actor at the drilling phase, and then the production of hot water, and then the production of green electricity. How do you distribute um, the climate contribution to the different actor at this different stage of the, of the value chain is something that um, will be addressed without double counting. So we can see that digital technology do not support um, climate and uh, uh, SDG action only by streamlining, increasing efficiency and reducing cost. It is actually do, doing much more than that. The digital technology can go beyond just streamlining and increasing efficiency and reducing cost. In the specific application I share, they enable climate policies and solution that otherwise would not be possible. So it's more than increasing efficiency. So the combination of uh, Internet of Things, uh, distributed ledger technology and artificial intelligence to cover the production, transfer and processing of data along its value chain is particularly effective in that regard. So we really expect this com the combination of these three um, digital technology to contribute in broadening the space of climate action, making possible action that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Back to you, Benno. Thank you very much, um, Masamba. I, I have to say I'm, I'm impressed by the way you and the uh, and the uh, UNF Triple C have uh, have been uh, thinking through uh, the use of these of these technologies and and how to combine them to uh, to, uh, to 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 deliver. Uh, and uh, I mean, the two points I would like to bring home is our first on the use of DLTs. There is a lot of hype on the use of DLTs in finance, of course, as we know, around cryptocurrencies and now DeFi, decentralized finance. Uh, 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 burgeoning in many in many in many ways, uh, but DLTs are ledgers, and so they can be used also uh, to track uh, uh, outcomes in the uh, in the physical world. Uh, and um, and what I see really as a as a as a positive challenge is how to combine the two. That is how to combine a DLT approach where you can trace carbon uh, carbon outcomes uh, along a supply chain with a DLT approach, uh, say uh, for a payment system. Uh, yeah. So that uh, you can bring this information to the uh, to the merchant, uh, to the uh, to the consumer uh, at the point of sale, and uh, and then you need to connect the two, and uh, and uh, and and certainly there there will be ways to use smart contracts to kind of uh, 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 ship information in a, in a very efficient way from one uh, universe to the other, to the from the physical universe to the financial universe. And that's a, that's a very exciting uh, project for the future. Uh, and my second takeaway is, uh, and relates to what Brun Poisson was saying earlier, that's about trust. That is, uh, a, decentral, a decentralized approach to carbon tracing might be a way to uh, to uh, to create trust uh, in uh, in, uh, in numbers uh, and uh, and uh, and outcomes, which are, will not necessarily be trusted if they come from the government. Uh, and that's also a device that you can use to uh, kind of connect uh, connect people uh, to the uh, better to the whole process. And that, that's really food for thought. Um, let, let me turn to, uh, to, to Chen Long. And uh, I mean, first, if you have any reaction on what uh, Masamba just said, it's very welcome from, from your perspective. Uh, but uh, another question I wanted to ask you is about changing consumer uh, habits and patterns 
uh, the COVID-19 has been a big push for um, um, for online uh, uh, online uh, uh, commerce and uh, and, uh, and and for digital transactions everywhere generally. As we can see, by the way, today, this morning in this conference, <laughs> we're not together on a stage, uh, but uh, on, a, on a digital platform. And, uh, and this we can see in payments, of course, where there is a very, very strong push towards uh, digital payments and digital banking, uh, 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 which, uh, which COVID has kind of uh, accelerated, has boosted. Um, and, and, and the change in consumer patterns, in a way, on the one hand, can be very good for, uh, for, for, for carbon footprints because it's paperless and, uh, you know, virtual banking is paperless and, uh, and there will be, uh, uh, and presumably, ca more, more carbon efficient. Um, on the other hand, you also see some behaviors which are not that carbon efficient, like, you know, uh, kids buying T-shirts on, uh, uh, on Amazon and uh, the T-shirt will come from uh, someplace in the U.S. and travel like uh, 10,000 miles. Uh, to reach them, and if they don't like, if it doesn't fit, they will send it back to the U.S. Right, and that's two thousand miles, uh, twenty thousand miles. Uh, and uh, are they aware of the carbon footprint of that kind of consumer habits? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, and so on. So, so how do you see this evolving? How do you see the, the shift towards digital payments uh, uh, fitting in that discussion? Uh, so, firstly, I would, uh, I agree with Masamba that uh, uh, digital technologies. that can incentivize people and then we can also use that to measure the digital uh, uh, the, the carbon footprint so that builds ecosystem so that's much, that's actually a, a design it's much more than just that's Digital technology, of, of course, mobile internet uh, makes information digitized. So we can make use that information to the matter uh, carbon uh, preferring this or that. And so I, I don't think it conflicts with the trust. In China, in other, or in other groups, you can see that the two DLT is also combined uh, with that uh, with, with the digitized information. So that builds the trust factor that can be done uh, the build trust uh, through, uh, between the institutions or decentralized, completely decentralized. Yeah. Oh. Coming back to your question, I think the. Um, obviously, the last year uh, uh, has the whole digitization has uh, speed up much more uh, since last year. Uh, so, uh, somewhat thanks to the COVID, not everything is worse. Last year, China's uh, e-commerce accounts for about twenty-seven percent of the China's retail sales. In China, and China has more than a billion mobile payment users. So, in a sense, China has somewhat uh, made the trend of a digital lifestyle country. Now, the, in general, I would argue that a digital lifestyle is more environment friendly from both e-commerce and the uh, digital payment point of view. On the uh, e-commerce side. Uh, not only that, the, the, the e-commerce platforms, not only that, the way it trades and allo allocate resources could be environmentally friendly, it ha can actually contribute to promote uh, uh, environmental friendly goods and services. Uh, let me give you some concrete examples. For example, there's this one upcoming uh, 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 e-commerce platform is called the Idle Fish. And the young people really love it. What is Idol Fish? It actually trades secondhand uh, 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 goods. And now this year, it's going to finish, uh, uh, accomplish about 500 billion um, uh, uh, RMB of, the, of trades. Uh, so that's close to 100 billion US dollars. So uh, think about this way. For every uh, secondhand clothes we buy, it avoids the 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 production side of this. So that is direct carbon reduction activity. And young people, they love it. Actually, we found they are the most active ones. 
you don't do not have that much money you want to have a good lifestyle and it's an environment environmentally friendly lifestyle this is one good example I'll give you another good example of the digital technology that is the cloud computing now in this age uh, in the age of digitization actually com cloud computing is really the most efficient way of using the computing power it saves so many com companies of the, the IT, mm -hmm. IT infrastructure and actually, you can use the company power very freely, you know, allocate the time. And, and also, the company power is decentralized. So, computer pin power is another good technology, a digital tools that is uh, environmental friendly. Another example is the, is the logistic. Now, we can use the, 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 the smart routing. We can use the uh, green, green packaging and the uh, uh, green uh, uh, the the algorithms to make the logistic logistic much more uh, much more green so that's the I, i'm giving you some examples of how this technology can uh, combine with the with the e-commerce to allocate resources goods to make it much more uh, environmental friendly now on the on the payment side uh, on the payment side uh, not we're really witnessing a, a great transformation of the payment to make it so much more inclusive and uh, and sustainable. Now we know that a digital payment is in gen is is uh, more sustainable, but it's so much more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Now it, it is so inclusive because the cost of using the digital payment becomes so much lower. Now in China, for example, nowadays if you we remember. If we in traditionally in, into in, with a big store, with the stores, you have to have this uh, post machine, the point of sales machine that can uh, have the proper risk management uh, uh, assessment. But nowadays, that you can access using the QR codes. Uh, it's the, essentially, that reduces the cost of the post machine to essentially is zero. So everybody can use it. In China, if you travel to China, you can see the beggars using the QR code. That's their post machine uh, for for the digital payment. So I think that's that's why you can see that in China, where they see we have the more than one billion uh, uh, the uh, uh, the digital payment uh, users. Now the digital payment is not just a payment; it's a actually a, you can see it's a portal that can combine payment with so much more many more activities. The, the, the art forest is one good example it can be combined to measure the green activities to make things happen and many and, and there are many other uh, innovations for example sharing bicycle now in China that is another bit uh, uh, really uh, 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 emerging hobby for a lot of the people so because you have the digital identity now you don't need to have the have for the bicycle owners to be present to accept the to 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 to, to lend out the service now you, you only use the digital payment you can have the using the sharing bicycle uh, as so many more innovations are coming out based on the digital payment so um and so the, and all those things of course that reduce and also the, another good example, I think, is, is stride hailing that reduced the ownership of the cars. Now, so uh, I think what's crucial here is that we can see that the digitization and the green campaign, we can actually really go hand in hand and join force because the, the most, the biggest advantage of the, of the digital technology is to actually make things much more efficient was communicate, overcome the, the, the a lot of the uh, expense we, we 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 use on the on the on the distance on traveling a lot of things. So actually, that goes with the green campaign very much. And from our the theme of this uh, of this our uh, uh, forum, uh, it's not just about reducing the carbon reduction of the on the production side, but probably even equally important. Uh, it's also a much more efficient style of life and the mentality of all the users and the digitization tools can go a long way uh, to serve that purpose. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Long. But let, let me ask you a question. I mean, we, we, I guess we would like to, uh, to be in a world where you can have uh, carbon footprint metrics for individual uh, uh, credit card spendings at, at the point of sale. That is, anytime you go to a shop, you would like to see the... Uh, 
um, the, uh, the virtual ticket with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the carbon equivalent of what you, you've just spent. But do we have the right infrastructure to achieve that? Also in the light of what Masamba was describing uh, in terms of, you know, tracking the right information uh, up, the, up the supply chain. And do you have that in infrastructure in China? Uh, yes or no. It's, it's the, so I think the hardest thing for the digitization uh, it's easy to talk about, it's, it's easier to talk about the concepts, but the hardest thing is to have the design to, to cut it into smaller pieces, to accomplish it into smaller pieces. For example, in the armed forest example, we actually, we decided to focus on the carbon reduction activities we can measure. We cannot measure everything, obviously. We start from several categories, then go expanding that. Now, we realize that if you do that, now if consumers care, then I think producers, the merchants will also care. Now, then that can be expanded to the certain products we are sure it's, they, are, they are the environmental friendly. Then, then because the consumer have a preference, because they like this kind of the, the green type of products, then I think that will change the producer's behavior. Now, with better digital technology, you can, if you can measure more and more the whole production procedure, more and more the categories of the, of the products and services, obviously it would be ideal. But I think this is the, the most interesting part and it's also the hardest part, is to use the, to have the right design that can uh, solve part of the problem progressing from here. Because once you build an ecosystem, once more and more people get in, get involved, get incentivized, then at, you can, people have more incentive to, to measure things well, to be, to be probably rewarded. So, but that's, you have to go piecemeal. Uh, so it's not zero or one. Uh, that's the challenge or the art of the digitization combined with our green campaign. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree that you've got, you've got to show that it's possible so that consumers start asking for it. And when consumer will be asking for it, the, uh, the whole, uh, the, the rest of the economy will follow in a way. Uh, yeah. So you've got to show that it's possible, even with small experiments. Uh, so Brun, uh, I mean, any, any, uh, any, any follow-up thoughts, or and, and in particular, I would like to 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 pick your brain on this on this trust issue and whether the uh, whether decentralized approaches can help overcome some of the uh, kind of trust issues and political difficulties that you've that you've mentioned. I think I think you're right. I think decentralization would really help. Um, but I think one thing also that would really that would help is um, we tend a lot of private companies tend to assume that if consumers or clients ask for a carbon footprint, then then it's only then that we will provide them with the information. I'm guessing this is like the, the whole point of our conversation. But I think sometimes we also need whatever it takes, even if it's uh, not perfect at the beginning. And this is exactly what uh, Dr. Chen was uh, Chen Long was saying. Uh, we need to push for that, and this is the role of government. So at some point, at at least at the beginning, I find it difficult to do it in a decentralized way. It has you have to have a strong push um, from the top. Um, so, so that it becomes sort of more um, more widely widely used. But so that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, I would say it also depends on the sector of the economy. It depends on what you you what products you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about issues such as meat uh, or such as sorry food, this is of critical importance. This has a very very uh, strong political, at least you know, um, in countries such as. Now, France, this has really a, a, a very, uh, this is a very complicated and difficult issue with a lot of political consequences. But if you took, and if you look at cosmetics, uh, for example, I think the push from the market uh, is really, is really uh, much more uh, sort of easier and the government, and it can, you can go for a decentralized approach, approach uh, way faster. So I would say again, I, I don't know whether this is uh, helpful, but I would say that again, it, it, it depends on the types of, uh, of products. But I strongly believe that at the beginning, you have to have a push from the top uh, and a push um, and, and sometimes a centralized approach. 
So maybe this, this is just me being too French and too uh, sort of uh, Jacobin. I don't know how you translate it in, 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 into English. Um, but even though technically and, and uh, in, even though decentralized, a decentralized approach is more sort of uh, makes more sense um, concretely. And I think technically, I mean. No, oh, I mean, I guess a lot of this conference has been uh, so far has been about regulatory frameworks and uh, and uh, and uh, incentives to be given from the from the top by by regulators, by central banks, and by governments. So I think that's uh, that's fully accepted. But for it to work, it has to uh, it has to be it has to be uh, it has to be workable. Or it has to be accepted by uh, by economic players. So it cannot be entirely a top down approach, which, which is why we're having that discussion also on you know. Uh, decentralizing some of these incentives and uh, and making sure that uh, that you you create ownership uh, by the different economic players uh, okay can i can i can i push you a little bit brune on the on fashion because you mentioned the fashion industry and as it happens when when i was preparing for this uh, for this conversation uh, i came across numbers saying that uh, the fashion industry was responsible for 2.1 billion uh, metric tons of uh, of greenhouse gas emissions in 2018, uh, which is four percent of the global total. So if you, if you put it that way, that means that the fashion industry uh, emits uh, the same quantity of greenhouse uh, gas uh, as uh, France, Germany, and the UK combined. And so people are complaining that say Bitcoin is uh, consuming as many uh, as much energy as Switzerland or New Zealand, but the fashion industry is as much as France, Germany, and the UK combined. Uh, but of course, in a country like France, you're not going to say that fashion is bad, right? So how, how do you reconcile well, I, I, different political, uh, you know, tensions here? Um, so so thank you, Benoit. I, I didn't know whether I, I could or I should uh, mention that, but but you're right. And this was this was very difficult. Um, I, I I said it openly, and uh, and it. It was a big political row in France, but uh, and this is why, and this is the whole point of this conversation. This is why we had to to push really from the top. Uh, but I think we need to keep. Uh, and now there's currently a, a really a fight and almost a battle between uh, between Europeans and Americans in terms of defining the criteria and how you will measure the carbon footprint. Uh, so again, it all goes back uh, to 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 the role of regulation but also to the role of uh, political sort of trust and discussions ahead of launching such initiatives and i think mm, I, I think uh, the fashion industry is very sort of interesting in, in in that especially because things are not going better things are going worse uh, i'm gonna get a lot of calls after this uh, but things are, are, are getting worse because uh, and dr chen long i don't fully agree with you um so the, the second, uh, so, so people are, are, are buying more and more clothes, um, and the secondary market is actually uh, makes young people consume even more. So that's that raises a question as well. Um, so how and this is the whole issue of how do you change behavior? Uh, clearly, technology and even carbon footprint footprinting is not enough. You need to have some sort of. I, I guess it's the basics. But then you need to have a moral conversation because at the end of the day, uh, and but this is my view of things, and I know a lot of people don't share it. At the end of the day, it has to come down to also a moral issue, uh, and this is where, uh, and this is the point of our conversation. This is where also it comes uh, into and it comes to uh, broader conversations that, uh, that 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 need to happen at the at the country national level and, and even between. Us communities of of consumers Matt? i don't know Benoit, maybe you can push me even more if you if you wish. no no, no. I, I, I wanted to, i just wanted i would like to hear longer and react to that yeah. yes yeah i don't think there's any conflict what of what we're seeing here precisely i'm saying that uh, uh, it's very hard for people to change their uh, pursuit of the what they, they like, like fashion is probably one thing, but at least part of the thing we can do is to better use of the uh, the products that already used. That's the, the, the kind of thing I'm talking about on, on idle fish. So even for the fashion, so for younger people, if they produce the, if they consume the new 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 clothes, or, or always the new ones that, that will really have a lot of more production. And, but we can make 
if so every time we make better use of the current stuff the services i think it's much more efficient it's much more friendly so in that regard i'm really agreeing with you i, I think there's no conflict here i'm really happy to hear that actually so i would like to uh, i would like to um uh, to convey to you a question that, that was asked online by, uh, actually by my friend uh, Hélène Ray, who's a professor at the uh, London Business School, and she's a, she's a fantastic economist, and she just asked the following question, uh, she, so she's watching us, and she, she just asked the following question, would the participants agree to make relevant raw data, for example, on physical risks, carbon intensities, available to the academic community? So, how much of these data we're talking about uh, can be can be public, can be can be made available, in particular to the academic community? From 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 my side, uh, I, I consider that when it comes to carbon footprint of 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 product. Uh, actually, there is nothing uh, confidential. So this is something that uh, could be shared, particularly if it is at the, at the aggregate level. So for example, instead of uh, uh, saying what was the emission at the different stage um, of, the, of the production, along the supply chain if for the on pro for the end product there is a carbon footprint provided it it should be made publicly available including for uh, the um, academics and uh, universities and researchers and long i guess that's the essence of what you're doing at the at the Luohan academy no <laughs> yeah so we would like to it, it's it's obvious to make the whole thing work that our but with scholars, we have to really understand better how the, the impact of all the the measurements, the, the procedures. So, the, uh, much more research is necessary for us to make the right uh, uh, judgment. So, for that purpose, we really should pr promote for uh, with the proper uh, safe environment for the data. Then we should really promote for the research on those subjects to make things happen. So that's that's really the, the good direction. Thank you. So yeah, I, I think it's a, well. I think it's a duty uh, actually for that that companies share, uh, but that even the government uh, shares uh, data. There's no other way. Uh, I uh, there's actually an article in the circular economy law that I passed in France that sort of puts a first step towards uh, forcing uh, companies to actually share uh, some of their data related to the, to the carbon footprint and then more widely. But it, it, I think it's, it's, uh, it's really, they're reluctant mostly because of uh, cultural, because culturally companies are just, uh, are just not used to the idea of sort of open innovation and sharing, sharing things. It is starting, but it is too slow, I agree. And we need uh, academics more than ever to keep working um, on all this. So the least we could do is help them. So we are we are one minute away from the end of this session, and this has been a fantastic discussion. Um, as as a word of conclusion, can you just tell me what's among all the initiatives that we've been discussing? What's the top priority for you in uh, in a few seconds for each of you? What should we put the emphasis on? Brune, you want to start? Um, tr uh, trust and transparency. This is very cliche, but finding a good way of uh, being transparent builds trust, I would say. Thank you. Uh, Masamba? So from my side, I think we need to explore more consumption-based approach for ESG accounting, and um, not only at the individual level, at, but at the sub-national level and at the national level it makes sense to allocate responsibility and accountability based on consumption and not just based on production. Thank you, and uh, Chen Long? the awareness of the whole society and using the digital technology to build the, the right design for the ecosystem so that everybody can become a, a partner, a player uh, for, for the thinking. 
So with that, I would like to thank you uh, all three very much. Uh, this has been a truly fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, let's move on to the next sessions. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.